You're listening to a Brother Asks and Building Better Builders video education series production. Welcome to the Craftsman Online Podcast. This is a weekly program focused on the relevant topics in Freemasonry and the various aspects of the craft. Any opinions, thoughts, or viewpoints shared during this program are that of the individual and do not reflect the official position of any Grand Lodge, appendant, or concordant body from which that member may hail. I'm your host, Brother Michael Arce, co-founder of CraftsmanOnline.com, and he's back for a very patriotic edition of our podcast, Brother John Negi. Welcome back, Brother John. Thanks again for having me, Brother Michael. We're looking forward to talking about building Hiram, as some Masons are a bit confused when it comes to understanding the symbols within Masonic ritual. They have little clue as to the symbolic connections that are before them, and Brother John is also an author, as you know, and we'll be getting into the first of his series of books on Uncommon Catechism for Uncommon Masonic Education. This is Building Hiram, Volume 1. This is the first book, but was it your first book that you wrote on a Masonic topic or many Masonic topics, as we'll get into tonight? This was the fourth publication. The very first book let that I wrote was having to do with recovery, 12-step recovery. The second book that I wrote was Provoking Success, Uncommon Coaching for the Uncommon Soul, and it had an unbelievable amount of Masonic philosophy underlying it, but I never mentioned the craft in any way, shape, or form. And then I had a follow-up book, which was called Emotional Awareness Made Easy, Uncommon Sense About Everyday Feelings. And what's really neat, I did not realize at the time when I was writing it that I was actually writing about passions and desires, the entered apprentice, you know, emotional states, and it was long about, I think, 2008 that I started writing targeted Masonic literature for presentations in the Lodge. And it was all because I was very disappointed with what it was that I was coming to Lodge for. It was not the education and light that I wanted to shared with me. And as I voiced my complaints to the secretary, he basically said, well, write something up and present it. And I said to him, I can do that. He says, I just gave you permission. Do you have something written up? Is it ready to go? <laughs> so I wrote the orders of architecture. I targeted something that didn't make any sense to me at all, why these orders of architecture were being presented during the fellow craft degree. And so I wrote a paper doing research on it. And that was a lecture at first. And one of the brothers said, hey, that would make a great catechism. And so I wrote it up as a catechism. And the comment back from my buddies in the lodge were, well, how many more can you make of these? <laughs> how many more catechisms? And so I started writing more and they just flowed. I had questions that were never answered during my entered apprentice fellow craft and master mason degree. And I figured I'd start out with all the questions that I had as a mason coming up through the three degrees. And they never got answered to my satisfaction from the brothers that I asked them of. So I figured, okay, I'll find some answers that would make more sense to me and to other brothers who heard them. And I started putting together one catechism after the other. And not long after that, I wound up asking myself, what do I do with this? And as I was presenting these catechisms to the lodge, my brothers were saying, where can I get a copy of that? And so I put them together in a book. I got 12 catechisms and building Hiram. And as I was finishing up about to send it to the publisher. I changed the front cover from building Hiram uncommon catechism for uncommon Masonic education to building Hiram uncommon catechism for uncommon Masonic education volume one. And because at that particular point, I recognize, well, 
I'll put volume one and see what happens. <laughs> and right. and what happened was people are saying, where's volume two? <laughs> My response was, I'm working on it. And the other questions that came to me is, well, this is a great overview. Do you have something specific for the Ender Apprentice? So with that question, I started working on building Boaz. So, and I knew right away that, well, if I'm going to do an EA focus, I'll have a, a fellow craft focus after that. And volume four will probably be back at the master Mason level with just the master Mason focus and slowly, but surely they were built. The each mm. book was built. It is interesting. The outline kind of writes itself once you get the first one started. And, you know, again, tonight we're talking about the first in the series, uh, building Hiram volume one. I was looking through and this was copyright 2009. So almost 15 years ish is ago. I'm imagining that you, the 13. actual starting of the writing probably yes. was taking a place. It, it's been that. about 15 years for sure. The first one was a slow build up. But the interesting thing is because of all the research I did with the first one, it was several years of research. The second one came six months later because I had already done the research on a lot of stuff. And the more research I did for the second one, the more I had left over for the third and fourth. And it just like right now, I have literally 12 books in my head from all the research that I've done and no time to write them. Mm. So, <laughs> Well, I'm glad that we got into talking about this as kind of a summer book review uh, podcast theme for tonight, because as I mentioned in a previous episode, this uh, edition, this is my copy. I got this. Oh, geez, probably six years ago. Um, and I was a newly raised master mason who had a ton of questions. And one of my Masonic mentors, friends, I kept asking just random questions about from the Ashlers to some of the symbolism in the degrees to some of the larger Masonic questions. And I kept getting the same answer, which was, well, you need to read a book. You need to read a book. So he provided this copy for me. And what I took is a newly raised master mason it was very easy to follow along because there is that catechism that i was used to going through with the degree proficiency and in the ritual what was also kind of refreshing was in your introduction in this book you're very clear about that as you stated a lot of this came from your frustrations of there not being a source a resource a guide whatever you want to use and you were providing and sharing this knowledge with the rest of the craft. So that's why when I started reading it, I instantly was like, ooh, I want to see what questions he was asking. And then most importantly, what answers he got. I kept notes while I was going through my entered apprentice fellow craft and master mason degree on all the questions that I had that weren't getting either an answer or a satisfactory answer. And a lot of that became the fodder the grist for the mill, so to speak. And it's interesting. There's, there is a cross section of the brothers I've talked with smaller cross section that they don't like the catechism format. They love the prose format mm. of my books that followed. Okay. And there are others that say, wow, we really like the catechism and they're easy to follow and they help focus the mind and train the mind to ask questions. So I'm counting my blessings that I didn't keep one particular style in all 14 of the books that I published. I think it's 14. <laughs> well, what I noticed <laughs> is that you do get kind of a mix of your narrative voice with the storytelling where there's one particular section where you talk about being outdoors and seeing a tree and that it fell and that that and it led to a lesson it led to a point but then i also found i guess you know like i said comfort but also it was unique there there are very few other organizations or interests that you'll find that has a catechism that is very unique to freemasonry yeah well you're talking to somebody who was raised up north a long island and raised in a Roman Catholic family. And I went through first through fourth grade in a parochial school where they had catechism. So when I heard catechism, immediately I raised a question like, I thought this was not supposed to be a religious organization. <laughs> and what I found out is, yes, it is a religious organization, but it's not a religion. 
And at that particular point, I had to go into the difference between religion and religious. And of course, my trivial studies in the fellow craft degree helped tremendously in my understanding that, no, we're not talking about a noun, we're talking about an adjective, and then all the meaning that unfolds from that. But yeah, the catechism format is something that I was raised with. So when I joined Freemasonry, it's, uh, it felt comfortable, it felt like coming home. So there might be other brothers listening. I know I've been in this position as well, where you have a voice, you have an idea, you want to share something, maybe write a paper, you give a short talk in Lodge, which can maybe evolve to a presentation that could be anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes. Then you start writing more researched or deeper thought pieces. But your intent is to share them in a closed Lodge setting. And one of the things I like also about your book is the quote, if you're looking for secrets, there are none here and to find. What advice would you give to a brother who's listening, who's at this point where maybe they want to start writing their building Hiram? Maybe they want to start getting their ideas out to a wider audience. Do not talk about the signs, words, or scripts. Those are secret. Don't talk about your ritual. If you're going to be talking about ritual, talk about ritual in general and refer to stuff that has already been published so that it's very clear that you're not talking about the ritual that you are practicing in your jurisdiction. Make sure that you're talking generically about ritual and specifics about what has already been published. Again, avoiding the signs, the words, and the grips, because those are the modes of recognition that we have obligated ourselves not to talk about with the profane world or unknown individuals who we don't know are members of the craft or not. Th those are the two pointers. Stay away from the modes of recognition and stay away from talking about your ritual in specific if you're going to be publishing. Now, if you're going to be talking about the stuff in Lodge, well, if it's a closed Lodge, you talk at the degree level that it is opened in and make sure that you're addressing the brothers at the level that they are permitted to listen at. One of the things that's cool as a proud New York Mason, of course, we have our standard work and lecture. It's the nice thick blue book that's got all the ritual pieces in that you are given once you become a, a master Mason. Here in the district, Washington, D.C., we have something very similar. But we also have what I would call the companion guide, which is a smaller version that really gets into talking about some of the working tools and the lessons. And that you can keep in your breast pocket so that if a discussion were to be coming to lodge or a speaker was to say something, you could quickly open it up and, and have a reference. I understand there's a lot of jurisdictions that don't have that, which is why I love this book and have always recommended it to newly raised Masons. Are you surprised over the years to hear other Masonic educators or lodge officer mentors who have said they've used this as a study guide for their students? I'm more delighted than anything else. The fact that I put something together 12 or 13 years ago and have individuals who find it useful in bringing up the next generation. I'm delighted. It is something that was helpful for me to get a firmer understanding of what I went through. And the fact that I can share that information, that light with other brothers and continue to share it. This book is still selling to this day. And that is very neat to be able to see that there's a demand still for it. I imagine there's quite a few lodges that have this book on their library bookshelf, and some of them actually have disappeared, never returned. And so <laughs> what happens is I get orders from these libraries for more of the same. It tells me that the light's not only getting out there, but it's being appreciated and people are soaking it up. And that, again, is a delight. And what I love about this is that a lot of, and we'll get into some of the actual content that's in the book, but you take everything from, I was, we were just talking about it before we started recording. You'll talk about the, the Ashlers. You'll talk about the working tools of Freemasonry, a lot of the symbolism that is in the degrees, the things that 
unless you have the kind of mentor that really goes through every line in our ritual catechism or a lodge that has a variety of speakers that come and share some of this esoteric knowledge with you, you unfortunately could go through much of your Masonic career or journey without ever getting this light and always wondering. It's a lot of head scratching is what I would say. When you were researching some of these materials, what were some of the big aha moments for you that you were like, I can't wait to share this with someone new? The orders of architecture, the stone workers tools, the master's wages. These were aha moments that just absolutely were mind blowing to realize so much was hidden in plain sight and that all I had to do is make the connections and do a little research. And I uncovered so much and it didn't really take a lot of time, but I had a mentor over my shoulder. I had the spirit of a researcher uh, that was overlooking me and, and prodding me. And when I, when I say that, understand that I, I was raised by a man who, when he didn't know something within 24 hours, he knew enough about the subject to ask some very intelligent questions. And I saw how my dad used to research things. He made sure that there was always several versions of encyclopedias up on the bookshelf, reference books all over the place. And fortunately, I had something at my disposal that my dad didn't, and that was the internet. So I took all that training that my dad had enculturated through just me watching him, how he would research things. And that spirit was overlooking my shoulder. And I knew exactly how to look up things that I did not know about. And putting the pieces together, making the connections, that spirit was there guiding me. And so I had like a spiritual mentor encouraging me to research what I didn't know. And I aspired to be somebody who knew a little bit more about masonry than the previous generation. I really wanted to know what a lot of people would not look up normally. So I had a little spark of, I'm going to be th that mentor that wasn't there for me. And what's neat is over the years, I became the very mentor that I was looking to have when I joined the fraternity. and. I have a lot of people asking me a lot of questions and I try to give them the same kind of guidance that I received from my mentor early on, a foundation that was given to me by my dad. I'm sure if our listener was able to verbalize this, they would say the same thing I'm about to say, but I have always enjoyed as a listener myself of our podcast, <laughs> hearing some of the, you like to call them breadcrumbs that you drop, you know, throughout the episode. And I wanted to touch on two of the subjects because you just mentioned one of them. I have never heard of the order of architecture before until I got my copy of Building Hiram. So without giving it all away, because the goal is, is for some people to find, you know, your light and help support you. But what is the order of architecture? That's, that's a great question. And how many levels can we go into this? <laughs> it's a half hour show. Feel free. Yes. <laughs> the orders of architecture on the surface are descriptions of the pillars that you will find in various stages of evolution. You start out with the very simplest, plainest one, which is the Tuscan. And then you move to the Ionic, the Doric, and the Corinthian which supposedly are Greek versus the Roman of the Tuscan. And then you've got the fifth one, which is called a composite, which is supposedly Roman also. And what the lecture goes through is the orders, as in progressing from the simplest to the most complex. And on the surface, you're given the description of each of the pillars and how you differentiate one from the other. And at the end, you're told that these are pillars that we're supposed to be aware of and that we focus on the three and the, and the central core, which is the Greek. 
And then when you step back, you realize what they have just described as the progression of a master mason going through the education of Blue Lodge, that they come in as the most simplest of pillars, the Tuscan. And then as they focus on their strength and their wisdom and their beauty, each and every one of those pillars represents a wisdom, strength, and beauty. And after you focus on them, which are the Greek, and those are the ones that we are most interested as Masons, we recognize that if we do the work of the EA Fellowcraft and Master Mason, we are actually cultivating all three of those pillars. And then you find out at the very end, well, then you've got the composite. Well, the composite pillar literally is a blend of the other three, the Ionic, Doric, and Corinthian. And that's exactly the goal of masonry is to work on wisdom, strength, and beauty and become that composite pillar that is alluded to or spoken of in the staircase lecture when they talk about the orders of architecture, these five pillars, what they're really talking about is the Masonic path. But unless you step back and look at actually what's going on and how it applies to your journey, you think they're just talking about a bunch of columns, a bunch of pillars, mm -hmm. okay. and, and you, they're not. The other thing is that they are teaching you how to linguistically differentiate one from the other. So instead of referring to them as five pillars, you now have five classifications of pillars and how to differentiate one classification from another. And then what's really neat is that you can take that and overlay it on the Masonic path and you can actually recognize the classifications of Masons. Where are they in their Masonic journey? And have they actually become the composite pillar or are they somewhere stuck at the Tuscan, Doric, Ionic or Corinthian level? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> No, this is see, this is what I love that's just, because that's just a nutshell, <laughs> right? Right. I mean, I, just in that, and, and that's what you know. Reading this book and and getting that knowledge, and here's how you can instantly make it work for you: is the next time you're sitting in a fellow craft degree and you hear that middle chamber lecture, and you hear the senior deacon talking about these pillars and the order of architecture. Now you have that knowledge to go. And this is why this is important to this man at this time during his journey and why it's important for me sitting here on the sidelines to hear this at this point in my journey. So th this is what I love about what we do on our podcast. Um, Michael, brother, it's all allegory. It's all symbolism. And if you take it as face value, you're going to miss the lessons. <laughs> and there are thousands of lessons that are presented by the degree, the ritual and, and lectures and if you take the time to step back and look at what is being shared symbolically and allegorically and what it is alluding to, you have a much richer experience of your lodge interaction and the light that's actually being shared is a lot deeper than a lot of brothers gather. Oh, yeah. And this is the part of... Freemasonry, or actually Masonry, because we've had that discussion before as well, <laughs> that I get into when it comes to the Masonic education, which is the actual breaking down and in, into the deeper, larger meanings of our ritual, not just the order of these words, the sources of where they came from, but as you said, the, the allegory that even exists within the allegory of the, the meaning within the meaning. And, and that's why what surprises me is what is in volume one? It's hard for me to believe he's got 10 more books, <laughs> well, nine more books on everything that's missing from the explanation and literally cover, covers everything. I mean, uh, we, we've talked about it several times on our podcast as well. The Trivian, the Quadrivian, uh, the working tools, their meanings, the ruffians. We had a conversation about that on the last time we connected. But one area that I spent some time studying thanks to this book is the idea of the master's wages. And we've talked about this before, how we're told that it's corn, wine, and oil. But your research takes us into some deeper places, specifically on the idea of the last wage. What's that? Well, 
there's a story behind this last wage that just absolutely it, it's it's amazing what I went through to get such a simple answer. I took a look at the four quadrants of earth, wind, fire, and water. And I was able to associate the three fellow craft wages with intersections between three of those four. And after I put it all together and rearranged them, I said, there's a fourth wage here. And the fourth wage is between fire and air. And I said to myself, okay, let's just look as far as we can. So I went into the alchemistry. And what I found out is that the interface between fire and air was crystal. I'm saying to myself, what crystal could be considered a wage? <laughs> Michael, as soon as I asked that question, I said, duh, salt. <laughs> And I said, salt, salary, saline, you know, it's like, mm. it was bam right there. And so I was digging deep to figure out if there was actually a fourth wage. And the moment that I came up with salt, I said, okay, I'm going to be really upset if I find this. And so I plugged into a word search into the Bible particularly the Old Testament. And there it was in one of the chapters. It was literally where it spelled out that the wages that are to be paid to the builders of the temple are corn, wine, oil, and salt. And at that particular point, I said, holy crow, it was hidden in plain sight. All I had to do is if I had plugged in the three and I just kept on searching to see if there was a fourth one, I would have eventually stumbled right into it. But I went by way of alchemy. I went by way of the four quadrant circle dividing the, the Greek elements. And I came up with salt the long way, the hard way. Hmm. And the moment that I came up with the word salt, I searched the Bible. And there it was. It literally said the wages of the temple builders are four in number. Mm -hmm. And there it was. And then what I did was I started looking at all the things that salt symbolized and was used practically. What I found is that never was there ever a covenant made without salt being present. You look it up in the Bible. Whenever you see a covenant going on, there's salt involved. And what else? It's used as a preservative and it's used as a whole. Literally, I think there's 10 things I went through in that chapter, all the things that salt are used for. And then I recognized, well, that would make sense why a master mason had to be present at the EA Fellowcraft and master mason level, because they're the ones with the salt. They're the ones that can seal the covenant, they symbolically represent the salt that is present when a member is taking their obligation. Right in front of them is the representation of the covenant, the salt that needs to be there to bind the covenant. And that was pretty cool. <laughs> I just want to say you're welcome to the brothers that always say thank you for getting him to open up on the <laughs> And I feel the same way because now, I mean, w while you were talking about that, I'm like, you know, it's interesting. Salt has become so common because of, you know, table salt and cooking. But you're right. I mean, even in people's health, when you don't have salt, you ha you start to develop uh, deficiencies and, and health issues. And it's one of those simple things. Again, you're absolutely right. Hidden in plain sight. And people years and years ago were paid in salt. That's why they called it a salary. It was <laughs> salt, salary. You know, the etymology is all there. And, and yet we skip over it. We talk about the fellow craft wages, but there is nothing written about the master's wages, which is, you know, salt is part of that. 
The book is Building Hiram. It's just the first volume in a 10-book series. We're going to have the links to purchase this book and get your collection started in the show notes for this episode through Amazon to help out Brother John. I say it's a great resource for Master Masons. Personally, as I said, I use it as a quick reference guide for a lot of Masonic terms and topics. I also have pretty much the same thing in, in a biblical sense, a Roger's, a Roger's version of the Bible, so I can look up those quick words and also find it very helpful when going through catechism or our ritual. We talked about how it started with building Hiram, then you got to volume two, three, and four that handle the EA, Fellowcraft, and Master Mason degrees. How do the other titles in the Uncommon Masonic Education series, if we're going to you know, get the whole thing for the lodge. How do they build off of volume one? Where does the story end? Building Hiram literally translates to building beauty because Hiram symbolizes beauty. Building Boaz is volume two, and that's building strength, which is exactly what entered apprentices have to do. Then you have building Athens. Well, Athens was named after Athena, the goddess of wisdom, which is all what we're supposed to be building in the Fellowcraft degree. And then you've got building Janus, and Janus is the god of insight, of passages, of doorways. And when you get to the Master Mason level, it is at that level that you're working on spiritual, bringing order to the chaos of your spirit. And that requires insight. And so all four volumes are catechism-based, 12 chapters apiece. And at that particular stage, I went ahead and wrote a book called Building Perpins, and it's five sections, EA, Fellowcraft, two levels of Master Mason, and the, the very beginning chapter is about the craft in general, whereas the first four books are designed to rewire your brain to seek and ask questions. The fifth book is designed to get you to think outside the box, so I've got over a thousand aphorisms in the book that if you take them literally, you're going to be scratching your head. But if you take them figuratively, they're going to make a lot of sense. It's going to train you to think outside the box. When I got done with volume five, I worked on volume six, which is building roughish, a word that I made up basically to kind of poke a little fun at the ruffians. And the entire book I lovingly referred to as the field guide to the North American ruffian. And it was at this stage in my writing where there was a lot of questions about ruffians. And so I decided to write a field guide. How do you identify them? What are their traits? What are their characteristics? How do you deal with them once you've found them? And what's the difference between a ruffian and a Cowan? Mm. So this was a great idea. I can tell you I've had some pushback, particularly from one brother, a brother I, I dearly love for he contacted me and he cussed me out for writing a book that kind of hinted that we ought to be spying on our brothers. And I said, did you read page such and such? And then the very last entry in the very last page at the bottom of the book. And he said, no, I said, brother, this is not about them. This is about you learning from them. This is about you understanding how to identify ruffian characteristics by just observing your brothers, because we've got ruffian characteristics that we need to be divesting. And the best way to do transform yourself is to observe it in your brother and then say, ah, I do that. What can I do to change that? And of course, I have in the the book, a way of dealing with a ruffian characteristic so that you can divest yourself and work your way out of ruffianism. After that book, I had some individuals ask me about the Masonic cement, because the question is, we got this operative trowel that we're supposed to be using speculatively. So where's the operative cement that we're supposed to be using speculatively? We're supposed to be spreading that cement, but how do you make it? And so I spent a good year researching how to go about making operative cement and how to take that operative cement and apply it speculatively in our lives. And that opened up a door like you wouldn't believe in my life, recognizing how many loves that I actually have in life. 
and how much time I have spent pursuing different things that I love and how I have spread that love through my writing and my sharing with brothers throughout the world. And then after building cement, I guess I'm up to book number eight <laughs> is uh, building free men. And the interesting thing about building free men, which is volume eight, is it actually begins the craft series. I should have named it something along the craft lines because it's a diversion from what I was writing before. I was focusing strictly on ritual and building free men tunnels deeply into the meaning behind the words that we use in ritual, particularly the words that have the word free in it, free stone, free and accepted, free mason, freeborn. And I discovered that the word free, when you apply it to the words that we use within the craft, does not mean what it means today. You have to take it from a 13th or 14th century understanding of how that word was used to translate a word in French that does not mean unrestrained. It means something utterly different. Hmm. And that was an eye opener. And the moment that I wrote that book and did the research is the moment that I said, oh, my God, everybody doesn't understand what it is that we are. <laughs> just, you know, we, we're using these words, but they don't understand what the words actually mean. And at that particular juncture, that inspired me to write The Craft Unmasked because The Craft Unmasked took the word free and it ran with it. And I discovered what we actually do as opposed to what we say we do and what we are versus what we say we are and the difference between history and lore. And from that craft series, I went on to the, the next book, which is Craft Perfected. Uh, came the Craft Mastered because in the craft perfected, I outlined exactly how we are supposed to be going about perfecting our craft. Because in the craft unmasked, I described what the craft is, and the craft perfected is how do we perfect it. And then the last in the series so far is the craft mastered. The craft mastered basically says, okay, now that we know what it is and how to perfect it, what is the end goal? How do we actually get to mastery? How do we complete the temple? And how do we start working on that beautiful spiritual building that is alluded to in the first degree? Mm. And those are the books. Now, there's other books like The Light in the Garden, which takes a Socratic approach to the Garden of Eden tale using the trivium. It's unbelievably Masonic. And that was a fun book to write. And I started it over 32 years ago, wrote it five times. And it was through my work in the craft that I was able to decode the Garden of Eden, find out what the actual original sin was versus what we're being told and why they were thrown out of the garden and how to actually get back in the garden according to scripture. And I also wrote a wonderful fun book called The Journeyman Papers, Uncommonly Grim Lessons, where I took 10 of the 11 masculine-oriented Grimm's fairy tales, put them together like a deck of cards, and made one long tale out of it, and laced it with Masonic references. And if you enjoy Grimm's fairy tales and you love looking for clues, it's a fun book, fun book to read. It's amazing because you have this book, all the others that come after it in the series, the additional works. He's also got a blog where every day for the past many years, <laughs> he's shared his thoughts at Building Hiram, uh, which is the Building Better Builders blog. And what I'm taking away, as you kind of alluded to, is I've marked a page here and we will be having an episode for sure on the question of perfection after I read the book that goes into more detail on that, but you know, I forgot to mention something. There's another fun book called a brother asks, and it's all about the Hiramic legend. And as a result of a lot of brothers asking me a lot of questions about Hiram and the ruffians, I decided to write a series of articles with was just Q and a between brothers 
And I've got to tell you, it was one of the most fun books to not only write, but it's a fun book to read because you're, a, you're literally a fly on the wall listening to two learned brothers talk about the Hiram and Biff tale. And that was a lot of fun to write. Well, and I appreciate you coming on because for the brothers listening, they've now heard the catalog. And <laughs> as we, we joked a little, if you're looking for some summer reading and you want to expand your Masonic light, this is a great place to start with our author tonight and friend, Brother Nagy. Once again, thanks again so much for coming on. You're most welcome, and thank you for having me. Thank you for giving the brothers an opportunity to tune in, get a little light shared with them, and some insights on what it is that they can be finding for themselves and how to go about it. You are presenting to our Masonic community an invaluable service, and i just honored to be tagging along. Uh, you're directing it, and I'm helping provide grist for the mill. Perfect. And I hope the brothers listening uh, enjoyed the holiday and or later on will be hearing us after you enjoyed the holiday, which is plenty of time with the family, watermelon out in the sun. Just enjoy being American. Uh, we will get back together for another episode with Brother Nagy coming up on Monday, July 18th. And it's a topic that I've had circled on my calendar for quite some time. We're going to be discussing the concept of listening to the universe. Ooh. I'm very curious how many unicorns around the campfire mentions will be in that particular episode, but uh, well, we'll cross we've, that bridge together. <laughs> we've, we've got an unusual episode this time. This is the first time that you've mentioned Masonic unicorns first without me bringing it up. <laughs> <laughs> Another first. Well, if Masonic education is important to you, we've given you plenty of resources. Let me throw another one to you. It's our website, craftsmanonline.com. A reminder that new episodes of our podcast, those are available every Monday morning. And until next time, let peace and harmony prevail. You've been listening to A Brother Asks and Building Better Builders video education series production. Beep, beep. Beep, beep.